This is Changemakers with Katie Gore, finding the right solutions for the affordable housing community. I'm back again with Joseph Deal, the Interim Executive Director of the National American Indian Housing Council. We've been discussing the efforts of NAIHC to support American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians and their self-determined goal of providing quality, affordable, culturally relevant housing. Now, Joe, I've seen some beautiful new construction of tribal housing that has really paid attention to artistic and cultural sensitivities and the facts of their journey. Can you share some of the success stories despite these funding obstacles and the land obstacles you talked about in part one? Uh, Sure, there's many success stories out there, and there are actually other federal funding programs. One is called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, where a tribe can work with Wall Street investors or groups that want to give back. Um, They're able to get um, funding uh, directly from these investors. The investors get a tax benefit uh, for funding, and then the tribe gets the funds which are used in innovative ways. And so um, uh, some of the examples, very hard to describe, but, you know, like in the Southwest, there's issues with water, um, sewer, electricity, and so a lot of the uh, the innovative stuff comes about with solar uh, solar energy uh, farms and the history of certain tribes in the Northwest. Um, the grandparents and the parents and the children lived in one unit. Well, HUD had occupancy rules, right, up until the Self-Determination Act where, oh, no, that's too many people in one house. It's like, but that's our culture. That's oh, how right. you know, we raise our people. And so the some of the innovation has come about because HUD has recognized that, again, it's not a cookie cutter. Uh, and you know, we need to really address the things that are of value to people. So, so those are some of the things that you know we see out there. Um, I can tell you that every year at our conference in June, we highlight new projects, things that people are doing outside the box, um, anywhere from tribes are now going off reservation, buying fee simple land, right? Which anybody can do. Like you and I could go out and uh, buy a lot or whatever, and they build a house on it, and it's for their tribal members and not on the reservation. So that's a uh, that's very um, uh, in- innovative. It takes money, of course, to do that, but it allows uh, someone to have o- home ownership that, again, on the reservation, the schooling is not good. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of high dropout rate. Uh, to go to college, uh, as you probably know, as a young person, it's not cheap anymore as it was in my day. But uh, it's something that, you know, they're struggling with. Uh, We started in the Northwest, by the way, just as a side note, a youth scholarship program where our uh, vendors and people that supplied things to tribes would chip in. Uh, Of course, we twisted their arm, but they would fund money. And I I believe that fund was uh, around two or three hundred thousand by the time I left. I'm sure it's been growing since. So. Yeah, a lot of uh, good things happening out there. And again, it's the create creativity, innovation, cultural relevancy. I mean, the, you've seen some of the, the housing in the Southwest that just blends right in with the environment, you know, with the color scheme and um, the things that are important to the culture uh, in, uh, in, uh, incorporated into the housing. It's really quite fascinating. Many of our tribes, if you were to stop, and I've done this before, I've driven up to a tribal housing headquarters and said, hey, can I get a tour of your housing? More than welcome to show you around. And uh, they're very proud of what they've done with very meager resources. We featured Oscar Arana previously on a podcast, and he even talked about one particular apartment community that built in arts and crafts studio room within the apartment building to try to bring in that culturally important dynamic of being able to do arts and different activities. And we are seeing more and more creative incorporation into housing, but uh, there's a long way to go, isn't there? A very long way to go. And at our um, three events that we have every year, we typically try to highlight uh, one of our members, uh, either their music or their their art. And so, yeah, it's 
really fascinating. And for me, who was not exposed to that culture as I was uh, growing up, it has been an eye opener for me. And, uh, and I love working in Indian country. What gives you hope when you think about how you can accomplish affordability issues for this particular community in the years ahead? Is there something strategically that you're looking at that just really gives you hope? Well, you know, what we kind of look at is provide tools for tribal housing professionals to do their job, right? Now, some people say, well, tools, would that be money? Well, no, it's skills. It's, um, again, what you were talking about, resilience, incorporating their culture into their housing. And we've been very successful, actually, with several uh, corporate funders. And so there are foundations and corporate givers out there. And because we're 501c3, uh, we're able to accept uh, grant money. And so during COVID, for example, we um, were able to get some funding from a large bank uh, from their foundation side, and we were able to provide um, some you know, relief because COVID hit really hard at the tribal level. And again, all of us you know, who live in an urban area, you know, just go down and get our vaccinations and, you know, there's uh, readily available tests out in the middle of rural America, right? There's very little resources for, for folks. So again, we're kind of thinking outside the box, going with the flow, seeing where the needs are. And I think to answer your question, our job is to provide uh, like a toolkit, right? So we recently entered into a program whereby Hey, if you're in the middle of uh, South Dakota, you may not be able to travel to Chicago for one of our trainings, right? And so what we have now is e-learning. So they they can get online, uh, have the course at their offices um, or at home and uh, learn that way. So again, tools, right? That's what we're always thinking of, resources. And we really, really, really admire their resiliency and their way to cultivate new ideas and uh, new things that just surprise me every time I hear them. You mentioned health outcomes and community health access. That naturally lets me think of e-health as a tool that we've all learned to use. But how does housing and public health intersect with the population that you're serving? Give us some more ideas about what the needs are and what's happening. Um, You've mentioned it a couple of times as far as the health access. Yes, I'm glad you asked that question because, uh, again, when you're out in a rural area, uh, medical professionals, even nurses, typically uh, live and work in a city. And so those resources are just not out there. So one of the things that we did to intersect with housing, and this was a tribe that was in eastern Washington state, um, they created housing for their tribal members, but they designated uh, three or four units that would be for doctors who could come out, spend a couple of days uh, from Spokane uh, and live there com- uh, in, a, in a comfortable place and serve tribal members that way. So that's the kind of innovation that they look at because to get from Spokane to the tribal reservation, it was probably two and a half to three hour drive. And so to come out and see three or four patients didn't make any sense. But if they can come out once a week, every Monday, right, come out on Sunday and then leave on Monday night or Tuesday morning, then um, people can be served in that way with better health care. So there is an intersection. Again, it, it kind of requires innovation because otherwise tribal members have to figure out transportation and how to go to the so-called big city. Um, uh, but the Indian Health Service... Again, it's another federal government program that needs a lot of funding uh, because there's a lot of issues with health in Indian country. And so uh, it's one of those things that we don't advocate for that per se because we're housing only. But we certainly work with the Indian Health Service. We have them you know, come to our conferences. And if they're able to do some training, we definitely would invite them to uh, share what resources are you know, available to our tribal members. So what do you predict for 2024 as you're going to be celebrating your 50th anniversary and you're tackling some legislative or regulatory issues 
any predictions on other items that are going to be on your agenda? Katie, I think one of the things that we try to do through our legislative conferences is, is to make sure that our members of Congress uh, have face-to-face, touchy-feely meetings, and they can hear the, the real-life stories. It's amazing because people come into Washington, D.C. from these rural reservations, and they're just amazed. You know, it's like, oh, it's just you see the wonder in their eyes when they see these glittering buildings and... Uh, you know, get to actually meet with a member of Congress that represents their district or possibly one of their state senators. And like my first visit to D.C. back in 1998, I was nervous, right? And so it's like, oh my God, member of Congress. And my mentor at that time said, Joe, these people work for you. Drop the nervousness. They want to listen to what you need. And of course, that was before all of the political infighting, but it's still makes a difference, Katie, if you can really talk to people. I think some of the most successful uh, legislative visits I've worked on was where we're meeting with like a sitting senator, high-ranking senator, and a tear comes to their eye. It's like, okay, our message is getting through to them. And so those kind of moving moments are what we need uh, in Indian country. We need to share our stories. We need to share our cultures, why funding is important. And it's an obligation of the federal government under the treaties to provide this funding. And that's been wo- woefully short. So my prediction for 2024 is keep the fight going. Talk to members of Congress. Tell them what you need. Expand the low-income housing tax credit program, which su- supplements the housing block grants. And so that's our mantra for 2024. Joe, you have given us quite a level of awareness here, and we appreciate that. I Appreciate the message and that you guys are going to keep our public officials uh, moving in the direction that they're obligated and that they just really need to pay attention to. And that that happens from hearing voices like yours and having your members in front of them, exactly what you mentioned. So we applaud you and your efforts. As we wrap up here, Joe, I uh, think what the association is doing is is amazing. Is it at a council, or do you call yourselves an association? Well, um, we call ourselves uh, NEIHC, and it is a council. Um, and so um, we just have a unique formation under the Internal Revenue Code where we're able to secure grant funding at the cost of, to some extent, those groups that are public charities cannot do as much lobbying. But it's not us doing the lobbying. It's our members who come to D.C. and actually do that uh, work for us, right, or for them, actually. So, yeah, uh, it's a unique situation. We've been around a long time. I really appreciate that you gave me this opportunity to to share, and uh, I look forward to seeing more of your podcasts now that I'm very familiar with it. Actually, I just want to see myself. <laughs> That's all right. You've got a great message to share and a great organization and a conduit to do it. So we're glad to have you here. Thank you, Joe, for taking the time, and uh, we look forward to a strong 2024 for you guys. Thank you, Katie. Take care now. Thanks for listening to Changemakers with Katie Gore. To find out more about Katie, go to quadel.com. That's Q-U-A-D-E-L.com. This has been a production of Forbes Books Radio.